what's up, everybody? Welcome to the D Measures Podcast, D-Measures. where the measures D-Measures. are drastic, D-Measures. meaning the bars are filled with long lasting, far reaching effect. Now, this show is all about the power of music, it's about the power of musicians' influence and how those intersect with responsibility. At its core, it's a conversation about the importance of music and its creators. I am your host, King Midas. And I have spent the last 20 years in the music business working behind the scenes to help thousands of musicians monetize their content and share it with the world. All right. It's my sincere pleasure to highlight up and coming artists and entrepreneurs and discuss their views on some of today's most controversial topics. Okay, so we've got a fantastic guest with us here today. Uh, It's a gentleman by the name of Jerron Rose. He is the CEO of Critical Hustle Entertainment. Hailing from the great state of California and the city of Compton, Jerron has worn many hats in the entertainment industry, starting out in the 2010s as a successful independent recording artist, and then pivoting to management and concert promotion with well-known artists such as Rakim and Large Professor. He has now also added the title of investment partner to his business. Jerron, how you doing today? I'm doing good. Um, That's like the best intro I've ever had uh, in my life, so I I definitely appreciate it. Uh, I just want to say (laughs) Compton. There you go. There you go. Yeah, man. You know, like I was saying, you know, I've known you for quite some time now, and um, what I appreciate about, about you the most is definitely that hustle, um, which is, um, you know, what I think you epitomize is uh, what your brand says is a critical hustle. Um, tell us a little bit about you. You know, what would you say uh, started you off down the path of independent music and putting out records and things like that? Because back in 2010, people weren't doing the indie thing as heavy as they are now. I think the industry changed and um, with how music is consumed, um, independence is really the thing that makes the most sense. But back then, that wasn't really the case. So what kind of made you take that pathway? So I guess the easiest way to say it is I'm going to date myself a little bit, but it probably started uh, with Crush Groove. Um, I saw Crush Groove as a kid and where most people wanted to be Run DMC. I wanted to be Russell Simmons like that. That was my immediate interest. I had really no interest in being the person on stage. I don't know why. It's just what I gravitated towards. So loving hip hop and all those things, I kind of just always was on that path. And then I'm skipping so much. But by the time we got to 2010, at that point, I had pretty much managed an independent label, um, ran a recording studio. So none of that kind of came into like any kind of real thing and i was like well i know i didn't waste all this time and i can rap so right. let me let me figure out how to put my own stuff together and i dropped the mixtape probably you get older and the date start stop making as much sense but i dropped the um i lost my hustle but took yours mixtape first in right. 08 i the funny thing about it is i can't remember how i dropped it or where i put it or whatever but it made me feel like yeah go ahead and do an album so, <laughs> so Gaslight, I, yeah, yeah. I, I have. I, I can tell you right now. I have no idea what was going on. I just did it. Um, and once I did it, I was like, you know what? I could do an album. I put the album out, and it took me a year because I recorded it all inside. I put a little studio in my house. Little Wayne, actually, I'll say Little Wayne was a good influence too because what I realized was if you don't leave, give people room to breathe. Yeah. then you can win and so first thing I did was I put a studio in my house um, after I had ran the studio I knew how to record and everything so just made it easy to record and cut all my costs down and then it just made sense to go recorded that album three times right. <laughs> uh, just to make sure it was right but that was that was kind of the, the thing that got me going was I knew how to do everything else and so it was just a matter of figuring out how to release and thankfully I had some um, friends to introduce me to CD Baby, which is funny, you're familiar with CD Baby really well, but Very much. a friend of mine put a, put a project out on CD Baby, shout out to J-Docs, yep. and then I figured out a way to kind of do the same thing and, and jump on Apple or iTunes. Is, yeah, so. so that seems like a lot of foresight and a lot of um, just having an entrepreneurial mindset to do that because, you know, I, I hear a lot of artists that I talk to, a lot of young cats, um, it seems like they're more concerned about the fame and not necessarily the the financial um, the financial piece. Um, what would you say is it is that just kind of a um, an ingrained thing in who you are to have an entrepreneurial spirit and to to be able to 
you know, attack things in that nature? Or did somebody inspire you to, to you know, kind of do it that way or to always think like that? It's a, it's a mindset, if, if that makes sense. So how politically correct is this part? I, I don't know which way you may go with this because I'll be completely transparent. Nah, you know, you or, can say, you, yeah, you can say whatever you want on here, man. We keep it real around here. This is this is a, a so real again, conversation. So again, I date myself, but I grew up in Los Angeles in the 80s. Right. And and I saw a lot of entrepreneurs. Right. Right. <laughs> um, right. We're gonna get into that. <laughs> so so it's weird. I, I had the luxury of a dad in the streets and a mom who wanted me to get a really good education. Mm-hmm. Um, so she sent me to schools that were kind of like outside of Compton, basically, right? And so you get to see the difference in money, right? There's the guys over here who get money, and then there's like this whole other money. And uh, anybody who's known me for a long time knows that my fascination again went to Rockefeller, like that mid '90s Rockefeller, mm-hmm. and I wanted to be Damon Dash. Like yeah. he was like my favorite rapper because he reminded me of those entrepreneurs that I knew so well. Right. But <laughs> Damon Dash was 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 presented as the business guy. That so I yeah. think what happens, honestly. Yeah, it's using big words. I'm from Compton. I say, <laughs> but okay. <laughs> but um but really what the, the so I always say to this. I've been popular. Popularity is fleeting. It's not that important. It doesn't really mean anything. Popularity really only gives you control. And if you don't know what to do with that control, it means nothing. So I was always more focused on the money. Um it's just by nature. So you could kind of say that getting to the money was was the goal um and not being afraid to work but that's that's a whole nother you we, we'll probably get to that because that's yeah. where it, it yeah. trans it goes there but yeah the music the music it definitely was hey you know you could get a deal like here i'll tell you this scenario i was trying to get a deal when i ran the label in houston we Everybody, wanted a deal yeah but we were trying to get that like we want the label deal I was yeah. trying to get the label deal and was like, hey, we're going to get dropped. That's the goal. We're going to get like $2 million, <laughs> yeah. We're going to get dropped. And then we're going to kill this region. We're going to just kill Houston to Atlanta. <laughs> like, we're yeah, just going to... Because, you know, I mean, being in Houston, moving to Houston and learning that, that triangle of Houston to Dallas, you know, the ghetto boys were, were platinum in three cities. Yeah. You know, so when you start seeing the money from that standpoint, you're like, look, I just need y'all money to start me off. Drop me. It's fine. I'm good. Right, right, right. And that that seems to be such a a, um, a prevalent um, theme when it comes particularly to Texas artists. Again, because of that triangle, you see a lot. You saw back then, as well as now, a lot of Texas artists go the independent route just because they've got so many large cities in such close proximity. So it makes it easier. I don't want to use the term easier because any hustle is going to have some kind of you know grind to Correct. it. But it, it makes more sense, if you will, to um, to go independent because you can touch many more people in such a close proximity. So uh, that definitely makes sense. Um, so let, let's back up for a second because we went from Compton and then we got to Texas. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about how that transition took effect because Compton, obviously being you know the birthplace of gangster rap mm-hmm. and being such a hub for the hip hop uh, culture. What brought you to Texas? What was the the reason for that? Education. Drastic. Um, Drastic. So, again, being from Compton, you kind of, I tell people I was Kendrick Lamar before there was a Kendrick Lamar that people like accepted, right? Right. So you grow up in this environment, you see these things happening, and then at a certain point you start questioning, like, I go out to get a job, work, fine, no problem. But then you start realizing that, that this is not going to get me anywhere. Like I have to make some decisions. And so I had decided I was going to go to school. And at the time, the girl I was dating had just finished her last year at UCLA. And she ended up going to law school at Texas Southern. I went to visit her and I was like, you know what? This is pretty cool. Texas Southern TSU, go TSU. Um, <laughs> and I applied Shout to, out to TSU Vegas and Texas Southern. Yeah, definitely. I wouldn't be here for what's for them. But I applied to Cal State Dominguez and Texas Southern University. And I said, the first one accept me, I'm out. And this is the, I don't know how it is to get in TSU now, but I went to the LA Convention Center, filled out like this one sheet. And like two weeks later, I got this acceptance letter. I was like, I'm out. You know, I mean, 
I, did, I didn't know anything about open enrollment or any of that, but I just felt like God's going to put me where I'm supposed to be. And so I moved to Texas and kind of like once I got here, it is not a slight against the South, but being from California, things just move so much faster. Yeah. So I start seeing stuff kind of like the Matrix here. Like, yeah. oh, I can do this. Then I'm going to do this and do this. And people be like, you're doing too much. And I'd be like, hey, I moved from Compton. I didn't come here. I didn't come here to just be like, oh, hey, I'm here. My my goal was I'm going to work as if I had five kids. Right. Because worst case scenario, if I fail, then I'm going to support, what, two kids? But I don't have any kids. So just right. go as hard as you can. Don't turn down nothing but your collar and um, make it through. Absolutely. It's that hustle mentality again. And I guess I really believe that it is bred by one circumstance. You know, you have people who are um, who are given, you know, a hand of cards that make things easier. But then they see life in a different light than someone who may not have had the same privileges or opportunities. Um, and we see that all the time. Let me ask you this. We know that, you know, just from media and, you know, experience, people that I know from the area, um, that Compton is not an easy place to live. Um, it's, it's had, you know, it's got, it's challenges just like any other inner city, any major city. Right. Being as successful as you are um, and going through what you've gone through and um, where you've come from, do you ever have a sense of what they call survivor's remorse? Yeah, all the time. I mean, it's, it's it's weird to say i'll say it this way you realize one of the things that i try and tell people when they try and separate me from from what they their idea of what people from compton are going to be or there is you don't really realize how perfect things have to be to survive a situation mm-hmm. and it may not be perfect in the sense of oh well you hit the lottery and you're a multi-millionaire or anything like that but one different decision like if i go get in one different car or if i decide to go here or i stay too long at this place or you know any of those things cause any 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 different result than where we are right now right Right. and what i try and tell people and and what i would tell a young person now that's kind of like caught in the like you said the fame of things like this is some people don't have options right like genuinely you do or you don't is not really an option. Like the best way I explain to people is I grew up in a scenario where selling dope was an option. Like it wasn't like, Oh, I got to go do this or you can do this, but I'd be lying. If I didn't say at some point in my life, I wasn't like, you know what? I know that I know the right people and I know to be able to do this, but then you start, you start learning this. Yeah the measure of what's what's it gonna what's it gonna really cost you like i'm short i'm five six i played sports i was good at football i got recruited but at five six i knew i wouldn't go into the nfl and what i see a lot of times now is parents don't really know how to help their kids in terms of even with sports um so you know it's you're waiting to get recruited but there are 300 division one you know all these schools that you could go be in the middle of nebraska get a college education that's small division three Right. But if you don't know how to do those things, that's not a viable option for you. Right. So when you start putting all those things together, I chose to go get a job for the first, uh, I graduated high school 18. So for the first three years, I just went out and got a job, like yeah. trying to figure out, do the right thing, work in, and figure stuff out. But then you get to this place where you start realizing that like, I'm just spinning my wheels here. Yeah. What are my options? And then when you look at what the options are, you have to make a decision and you have to be willing to pay the penalty of making a decision that's not the right decision. And the one thing I will tell you that I will speak of myself only this time in the third person, Jerron don't do jail. <laughs> so <laughs> so right. when, j- when jail became like, okay, well, I could do that, but you either end up dead or in jail. Yeah. yeah, you know what? Let me go and try education. Let me go on and just break down and, and go see what a college degree can do. And it just so happened that I made what was the right decision. Um, Compton, Compton is not as hard as it is because you grow up there. So really, you don't get how hard anything is when it's your environment. You know, yeah. it's, it's it's just I know I don't go down these streets. I know I don't put on this color. Like it's yeah, normal. Yeah. Right. So, so 
man, I mean, I, I hate to, to, to really stick on this, but it's such an important part of some of, of understanding some of the problems that we have, particularly in the black community. You obviously looked at your situation and made a rational decision that yielded success for you. But there are obviously other people in those same exact situations, in those same exact circumstances right. um, that could have made potentially the same decisions but chose not to. What do you think are some of the factors that cause an individual to not make a decision that's for their well-being or to make a decision that's against their de- to their detriment? A lack of options. Resources. I mean, people don't like. I, I would you I, say I, you have more options and resources than the next person from the same area and from the same circumstances? Well, my mom. Like, okay. I, I get very specific about this. My mom made the conscious choice of things that how she was going to raise me, and we talk about it to this day. Like, she was. She said we moved to Compton, we bought a house, but I said you were never going to go to school in Compton. Yeah. So, like, as a kid probably third fourth third and fourth grade she mm-hmm. drove if you're familiar with la the best way i can say it is she drove from compton to los Feliz, which is like hollywood area mm-hmm. every day working nights to take me to school i went to school with a uh, punky brewster uh one of my one of my best friends who i always like 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 a brother actually um is chris clark who people know him now as young hump and he played uh, Shot G in the Tupac okay. movie. Right, right. Uh, son of Stanley Clark. So, like I said before, when you when you see options and you see that there's something else beyond your block, beyond your square area, then you kind of wonder, what is that? You know, maybe it's not deeply planted in you, but my dad was in the streets. Like, I, I, I can tell you that Saturday, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday, I stood on the street corner. <laughs> Oh, I guess it's specific now, but I stole the street corner off of Maine in um, like 90 seconds. Well, not 90 seconds, but on a, on a corner. So I've seen like drugs. I've seen police. I've seen the, everything that people talk about in movies. I've seen it. Right. But I'm the only kid there. Like their kids are out playing and riding around. A lot of them didn't make it. I was standing with my father and his friends. So like I saw that and I was like, oh, they have money. But then you turn around and then the person that you're sitting playing Foursquare with is a person that you watch on TV. Like you just know it's a different world. And so I always tell people, my mom made the biggest difference for me um, by introducing that to me. And I also understand that like not everybody's able to do that. So like you have different programs, like you had uh, the NFL brought yet to Compton. Um, You bring, there's, there's just always different programs, but a lot of it has to do with what you're surrounded by. I was the kid that, thankfully, my mom picked the street when they bought a house. My mom and dad picked the street where it was the old retired people, and it wasn't the gang street. My street was the street where the gangs came and played football. So, like, if I went to if I went to a store or something like that, um, well, I can tell you this is a funny story, and just to show you how it really is. Um, the school I went to, Los Felix, their colors were red, bright red. Like, so I had like red sweats and my gym clothes. Yeah. So I come home because I'm a kid. I go into the hamburger stand around the corner, walk in. It's nothing but Crips. I mean, when I say nothing but Crips, I mean like it was the Crip meeting. It was, yeah. it was, it was, it was, it was straight out of Warriors. It was like, yeah. oh, all the Crips are meeting right here. I walk yeah. in my red, and it's that that picante, like, oh, New York City's move. <laughs> and I'm a kid, and I know I'm completely. This is I'm wrong. Like I'm wrong, but I'm a yeah. kid, and I don't know what to do. Yeah. And one of the guys that lived on my street came up and was like nah he cool he from around the corner he live go street he good you know there but like those are the things that existed so i always attribute my mom at the beginning and then the big homie thing like okay. people don't really understand i always had people like and i always tell people god has a plan for me because there's every point of my life there's always been like the big homie making sure like you good let me give you the guidance the right way from that age all the way to my senior year in high school. The guys that graduated before, I didn't even think about going to college. So I went to go visit them at Arizona. So I think a lot of that is there's no more big homies for people. Um, there's a lot of self selfish mentality and not a lot of communal aspect of things. So lack of mentorship, lack of really parenting and lack of community 
um, I guess, focus or people participating in some sort of, you know, community, um, really, really just coming together as a community and respecting the community. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, but I just simplify it as people are selfish. Yeah. And now I and I and I say that not having kids because I believe parents do the best they can. Like I I think for the most part they do the best they can. Um but sometimes you may have to forego sleep. Like right? You you may have to you may have to be that parent. You have to be willing to sacrifice to be on your child's ass at, enough sorry if your ass is not working no, but, no, you, you, you. <laughs> <laughs> but but to be you you have to sacrifice because for me by the time I was having to be responsible for myself the only thing that was consistent in my mind was if I go out in these streets, that's fine. I'm, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Right. But I can't bring it back to my house. My mom is sacrificed there. Like from 12 to 17, I was home by myself. So like, I'm not going to act like I stayed in the house all the time. I was outside, but I knew that my mom come home at six. So I got to be inside before she get home and look like nothing happened. So I might be tired, but I knew that she was sacrificing. And so like a lot of it is you have to feel like you want to pay that back. And I don't know how that bond is built, but that was a big part of probably why I'm still here uh, right. and why I didn't get every car or go to right. everything. Right. I think it's, it's, it's definitely a combination of the individual, but you know, um, you know, my wife and I was talking about this the other day, how important mentorship is or having some sort of a positive influence, particularly for males, having a positive, authoritative influence on uh, that person, that young individual's actions in their life. You know what I'm saying? Because you can have you can see people who do positive things. But if you don't have somebody that can really have the authority to correct you or mold you and make sure that you're on the right path when you get off, which is inevitable because, you know, people make mistakes. That's going to make it make it harder uh, to make decisions that are, you know, for your benefit and for your success. Um, let's pivot for a second. Mm-hmm. Um, again, the D measures podcast is all about, uh, music. It's about music creators. We're about where those two things intersect with social responsibility. Uh, we believe that, you know, musicians well, first music is magic and we believe right. that musicians wield that power of magic, um, you know, with influence, but music being so influential, uh, what part do you think that music plays in some of the decision making processes of youth and even even adults in today's society? So I feel like the line between real and fake mm-hmm. got really blurry. Like I was just talking to somebody. I, I was talking to somebody. <laughs> blurry, talking, blurry. It's super blurry. <laughs> well, so so here here's the funny thing and and this will probably be the most controversial thing you have to have somebody say. Mm. So I decided probably like two weeks ago, mm. everybody we grew up listening to mm. was fake. Mm. Like everybody we listened to, everybody, 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 everybody. There was nobody. Start with in, NWA. Yeah. <laughs> and I love NWA. Like yeah. I, I rap because Ice Cube like that, yeah. but everybody was fake. And you know why? Because you can't convince me that the stuff that we're seeing today with these kids and the music wasn't going on back then. Right. It's just that these kids is like, oh, so I can be a gangster and, and I can rap. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and I'll tell you what they're doing better. They're supporting themselves. So like they not only, you don't have a dude come out from your hood who might be a killer or whatever, but then instead of him just going on and finding somebody random, he then went back to his neighborhood and put the next person on. He put money back into the hood. They get yeah. more guns, more drugs. Like it's self-sustained. Yeah, they, they didn't figure out the blueprint that these other rappers that rapped about from our generation and got rich and then moved on and like, yeah, like I live in the hills now. They ain't living in the hills. They, they put money back in the hood. Like, yeah. So it made me think about it. I was like, the reason why more people are dying because these kids are really living it. Like Ice Cube, I mean, the, my favorite thing about Ice Cube is that he wasn't a gangster. Yeah. Like he, I felt more akin to him because I was like, I know what it's like to be around all these people. I know what it's like to be able to tell that story. But yeah, I went to school outside of Compton. Like ain't nobody, right. there's nobody that I know to this day will be like, oh, Tron was up at Crenshaw or he was at this school. <laughs> nah, I wasn't that type of outside. <laughs> I was outside <laughs> with adults. Like my friends, when they start getting active and stuff, I casually be around, but I grew up around the adults. Like I tell people, I knew the 80s drug dealers. I didn't know the gangbangers. So like, 
you know, hey, gangbang if you want to. But by the time I got an age, nah, I don't really want to claim nothing. Y'all not making enough money for me. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's a. Um, I think to your point, you know, there's definitely been an evolution, and um, I don't know if we'll say. I don't know if I will stand on the term fake with you, but um, listen. <laughs> it is what it is. I, when I so when I say this, now, don't get me wrong. Yeah, I would say the people that were not fake that made it are anomalies. That's where I put okay. it. I because I, I'm pretty sure man, if somebody was real, somebody might have caught a body, somebody might have actually yeah, yeah, did it. Yeah. But in all reality, the two things that I came to the conclusion of is one, there's a lot of fake people in our in our. They, they gave yeah. the rules though. That's the yeah. thing. They yeah, gave yeah, yeah. the rules yeah. and they said it correctly. Yeah, yeah. but they was not out there like that. Yeah. And then the other side of it, I will say, is that the dope rappers, the really good rappers, mm-hmm. don't make it because it's only two. It's only two rappers. It's only two people that make it in music, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. You got you got the dumb guy that has talent that just signs the contract and then comes out later on and be like, contracts is crazy. And then you got the guys that are hustlers. Like they right. know they don't rap that well. And I and I fashion myself in that place. I go back and listen to my old music and I'll be like. I don't really know how I did any of this stuff. This sound crazy as hell, but all right, cool. Um, but I knew how to hustle. I knew right. I knew how to do it. And when you think about the rappers, it's one of those two things. They always had somebody who'll be like, he was dope. Like, I love Jay-Z, yeah. but Jazz might have been a better rapper for the time period. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's you. You gonna start some arguments in here, but we'll... I told you, I can't. I, I'm coming for it. I'm coming. I'm coming for the crown. Yeah, I want to be. Yeah. I want to be quoted in your future. There you go. There you go. Um, yeah, man, definitely. It's it, it's definitely a scary time right now. And then just kind of going back to the point, um, you know, I, I think that music and the lyrical content and even the emotional feel of the material has such a large influence on. Um, on the way that our kids are making decisions. I really just think, I I think it does. I think that you have uh, kids who are looking to these artists as role models and they are modeling their behavior after what they hear on records, not realizing or not even taking into account the, the future effect of their behavior. You know what I'm saying? So um, that's just an interesting thing. But do you think that musicians have a responsibility given that power? Because it's so it is such a powerful effect on society. Do you think that musicians have a social responsibility to uh, put out content, you know, that uh, will help people manage or help people understand consequences? No, <laughs> simply no. Okay. Uh, and I say that because music is art, right? Right, you, it's, it's a it's a form of expression. You express what you feel. I could turn around, like, and I, and I'll preface that also with saying, I didn't want to rap and go on stage. I used to want to be a ghostwriter. I wanted to be able to tell the stories and just be able to be as free as I wanted to be. But knowing I can't sit here and write a story about doing a drive by because I'm not going to go do a drive by, but I could write it right. So I think like I say this because I had a separation between real and fantasy, mm-hmm. right? Because technology makes people dumber, um, I you want to say yes, you want to say there's a responsibility, there's a there's a, na- a need to be my brother's keeper, but mm-hmm. in the reality of it all, no. But that's growing up in Compton, like nobody has to care. It's nobody's True. responsibility to care. It's nobody's responsibility to raise you. We can we can get angry, we can protest, but the thing about it is, is if you see, like you have you have you have sons, right? Yeah, I know you. So if by chance, ten years from now, I see your sons doing something crazy and they're familiar with me, I'm gonna go up to them and be like, "Hey, bro, what's what's going on?" Right? Mm-hmm. I'm taking that moment to say, "You're kind of tripping." Right, right. <laughs> but for me, I'm paying it back for the people that came to me and was like, "Yeah, you don't need to go. You don't need to be doing this." Yeah. So no matter what the music is, you gotta explain. You gotta get into your kids' heads. It's all Doritos. Like yeah. they spend millions of dollars to get you to buy a bag of Doritos. Just one bag. Right. That's the same thing as music is. They want you to believe that this is what it should be. And the reality of it is, is that you have to have a real assessment of who you are. Like I watched all when these when these track when the um was the drill music start coming, mm-hmm. I kept thinking to myself, 
where on God's green earth are these guns coming from? Like they right. were, like you know, it wasn't like regular yeah. guns. Like oh, he got a revolver, he got nine. Yeah. This dude got a gun. This dude got a gun yeah. that looked like if I join the military, I got to get special clearance to get a hold of. And don't get me wrong, the streets right. always there. But then when you're looking at a 15 year old kid, you're like, where's the money coming from? Where's the drugs? Come-? So like, before I want to change the music, I'm like, hey, it's the big homies. Yeah. Like, you clean the streets up, but you don't leave anybody to tell the message. Um, I'll say this. I, the one of the things that really upset me about California is Tukey. Yeah. And, and, I, and I'll bring this into perspective. Tukey mm-hmm. did what Tukey basically helped start the Crips, right? Right. Um, was in jail. Basically, his whole, he could do more to influence and talk to people alive then he would have been able to do if you kill him. There's no symbolism, right? Right. When you look at, um, the, if you look at the fact of that's what causes the problem, because even in the music industry, the people are saying what they need to say. If you look at a Jay Z, if you look at a Fat Joe, if you look at all these people who've been through all the craziness, right? Yeah. And the messages they try and convey, they try to talk to these young artists, right? But the labels are following where the money goes. Where's the energy going? Where are you driving towards? You want to have the best. You want to have this stuff. How do you teach kids that this doesn't mean anything? Like there's no there's no long term value to it. Um, you take shows like the Cosby Show off, whatever builds personal stuff. But you take the Cosby Show off, there's no more hope. Um, I went to a black college because it was born in me through a different world that right. made me want to go to a black college. And that's a perfect example of of media and content influencing successful decisions. Right. right. I mean, right there, those two things. And so I guess at some point you get to the, the hierarchy of uh, of business and how content is actually distributed to the public mm-hmm. but I almost a part of me feels like if the artist took the stand and understood listen I'm gonna I'm talk about shit that's gonna you know edify and build not shit that's gonna destroy and, and tear down you know what I'm saying and then and don't get me wrong it's because life is not all shits and giggles it's not all happy and roses and and smiles um, and to express oneself with art, I think there is some beauty in that. Okay. But at the same time, everything is not, you know, every day of your life is not, you know, dark. You know what I'm saying? And it is abundantly clear that, you know, some of these artists and some of the music is really made specifically to, you know, portray a, a specific image that is going to sell. Does that make sense? You know what I'm saying? So, I feel yeah. like there's some ir- irresponsibility there in that is the point that I'm making. Nobody is nobody is respecting the fact that you have a platform and you have the opportunity to influence the masses with what you say. So I just dis- I kind of disagree because th- there are people out there making that music. Like, you know, it's the same thing me saying like all of them were liars. You know, like they were all not fake, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody's not fake. Everybody's not in this one this one place, right? Yeah. We we grew up in the same era. So you still had NWA, but you had the Jungle Brothers. Like you had right. other places to go, but in in that old argument going back to my my the drug dealing people of the 80s, we don't own the boats. <laughs> <laughs> we don't own the farm. Like, you know, people have people have a responsibility to themselves to try and get out of their situation. And maybe it's because of my background in terms of life that I look at it like the drug dealer is a bad guy, right? Like yeah. he's selling poison to the community. Mm-hmm. But in his mind, he's trying to get himself and his family out of a situation. Mm-hmm. So he's making a choice. If I go open a McDonald's in Compton, like McDonald's ain't helping nobody be healthy. <laughs> but I go and put this here to make sure that my family is straight. So that's why I said it's really more so about selfish. So the thing is, you look at the Jay Z's, you look at like the Fat Joes. Once you get to a place where you're okay, question becomes, what are you doing there? Like, what are you giving back? Because even though every day is not dark, the people that are listening to this music, for them, they're still every day is dark. Like, I tell people, I remember, I know what the bad days feel like. And I didn't grow up in a bad place, but you see your mom struggle or you see her having a hard day and you don't process in your mind. It's just a bad day at work. Like she gets a check every two weeks. Food's going to be, you know, all these things are here. So you might be like saying, man, I wish I sold dope. I wish I could do something to help my mom out. Like I say that saying that 
I get from this view, I can sit there and say, you guys need to be more positive. You know, you need to make changes in the music. But the reality of it is, is you came from a place where you're telling this story. This story is what made you a millionaire. This is what keeps you getting money. So now you're programmed to, this is how I'm going to help. This is how I'm doing. All right, let me let me get my guy on next so I can put him on. Let me keep going. Let me keep going. If you realize that, like, that's the, that's the cycle of what it is, it's more so how do you begin to institute the change to where you make the days better? Um, the one thing that I tell people I loved about Nipsey, Nipsey was the most, out of all the rappers, there's, I don't know if there's been anybody to rep their hood as hard as him. He didn't represent right. the Crips. He represented I am from 60s. Yeah, yeah. And everything that he did was for his neighborhood. It wasn't this grand, like, I'm out here trying to save the world. Let me talk to all the black kids. He was like, if you live in this area, I'm doing this for you. I'm creating this STEM programs, all these things in his community. My challenge to people after he died was, why aren't more rappers following that? If you feel so strongly about where you came from, Kanye's got $9 billion, right? Right. I don't care about none of that. You from Chicago. You yell Chicago in a minute. You see what Chicago is. You have enough money to go buy one of those projects and renovate them to make affordable housing and not do anything. But the problem is if he goes and does that, he's no longer a billionaire because that's, that's what happens. That's what we've seen. So like, like I don't put it on the music necessarily, but I look at it as sometimes it's a means to an end. And once you get there, it's do you have it in you to go back and change? I love Dre. Dre's a billionaire, but I don't see no schools named the Andre Young Institute. In <laughs> right. You know, right. like like and it's nothing against them. They don't have to do these things. But that's what you got to start seeing. You got to start seeing the fact of I'm not just going to show you I can make it out. I'm going to put something in place that allows for those that can or parents that want to put their children here say yes. Right. You th these hundred kids that come through this are gonna make it out. You look at what LeBron's doing. Yeah, it, it's in Akron. It's not in Cleveland. It's not. It's in Akron where he right. grew up and where those he grew, kids. Where he grew up exactly, exactly. Man, I don't know. I guess we have to um, agree to disagree. I think there's. I, I definitely appreciate your point in that. You know, in this capitalist society, you don't have to do anything. You know what I mean? Um, but I do. I do believe that. Um, you know, people have to recognize their own potential and their own power for influence with what you say and then again particularly with music because music is such a, a special a special thing um Can I ask all right question? yeah go ahead quick question to that go for it when have they ever done it like if you think about when we were growing up nobody was doing it like it's never nobody, like right. no it's never been done so i don't even think it's fair to ask this group just because we're seeing such a turn because all the stuff they're doing has always been happening like yeah. I listened to LA I, death row music was all about gang banging right. you know like that's why I always say like but there was a dead friend the issue to me is let's apply pressure to the labels because they're the ones that are paying that's where the money is coming from because if whoever you want to whatever artist you want to name the worst artist that's out here shooting people in videos and all that stuff mm -hmm. they are getting a check they, they have a they have a job they signed up for a job so mm -hmm. they could quit their job but somebody else is going to come and fill that role the pressure to me is always about we can stop buying it we can stop well, promoting it but we have right. to go after the institutions so I, that's why I say I don't put it on the artist I put it on the institutions because if they stop writing it well, it's like, like you said. It's like you said. It's like you said. If they, if they quit their job, somebody else will, will will jump in and fill it. But again, it goes back to the artist. If the artist says, "I'm not doing that," like for instance, yeah, apply pressure to the labels and say, "I'm not writing that bullshit." You know, I'm not gonna write a song about this. What I know is to the detriment of my community. I'm not gonna, you know, promote material like this when I know it's to the detriment of my community. And we could get into uh, for another podcast. Y'all come back. Conspiracy, yeah, <laughs> the conspiracy, you know, behind the prison system, you know what I'm saying, as it pertains to hip hop and all of that, you know what I mean? But at the end of the day, if an artist is like, I'm not talking about that shit and I don't give a fuck if you give me uh, an advance or not. And I know that's hard for somebody from who's never seen a hundred thousand dollar check to say no to it. You know what I'm saying? But that's where it starts. It still starts with the talent. It still starts with the person saying that's not the type of music I'm, I'm going to choose to uh, to put out into, you know, into the Internet, into the space. Um, I mean, and, and believe me, and people say that. <laughs> right. 
don't get me wrong people turn it down i guess my point of what i'm saying is what moves any of it is where we're willing to buy so if we stop buying if if we if people stop spending money on it the labels will change and then the artists have the freedom to be able to say that but it's like going into your job how many people you know just be like you know what i'm tired of mcdonald's and how they make nuggets I'm not working here no more. I'm gonna. I want to go to Chick Fil A <laughs> yeah. where they get real chicken. Like, right? Nobody, like, you know, it's it's it's. it's but if McDonald's, st- but if McDonald's stopped making chicken nuggets though, and said you got to buy this, like if there was no chicken nuggets, people would still buy something to eat. If there was no gangster music, and again, don't get me wrong, because these things are happening in our cities across America. People are going through these things and artists are expressing what they're going through. That's fine. But then there's also a group of artists that are specifically, whether they're faking or not, talking about this type of stuff and per- perpetuating these things in order to sell records, in order to sell music. And Simon, it's hard to turn down when you don't have nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just at the end of the day, like we, it could be a hundred of us. That yeah. one dude that he can tell that story well. Yeah. They, 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 they gonna give him they gonna give him that advance and put the money behind him and be like, yeah, I feel y'all. Y'all doing good things. We gonna donate some books. Anyway, <laughs> little kill, little kill destroy is on his third platinum. Little album. kill destroy. About to go, about to go diamond. <laughs> but I, I, right. like I said, it's individualistic and I and I, I agree with you. Like you have to be a positive, you know it's balanced. You have to get positivity. I just find that you don't see it happening until you reach our age. To you survive that maturity you get to a level of place right and at 17 i just be honest i'd be like if somebody came to me at 17 and been like listen you from compton we want you to we want you to do this and we're gonna give you an advance of 2.5 million i'd have been like yeah i'm gonna figure out how to say it. i'm a tupac like yeah, i'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna yeah. be ignorant intelligence i'm gonna say <laughs> some really ignorant i'm gonna say some really intelligent stuff in the most ignorant way oh, like man. look dear mama i love you it feels good to be able to put money in your mailbox uh, yeah, yeah. Sell no dope. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's yeah no no that's real that's real that's that's definitely real so here, here here's the thing that kind of touches on everything that you talked about it still goes back to mentorship it goes back to community. Right. It goes back to responsibility. So I'm going to pivot real quick into another segment of our of our cast here. It's what I call what you think about. And the way it works is I'm going to just say, yo, Jerron, what you think about? And I'm going to throw out a name or I'm going to throw, throw out a topic and I'm going to let you yeah. pontificate, if you will, you know, as long as you want on that particular subject. So, All right. See how many I get through. All right. <laughs> so for this first one, we're going to say, Jerron, what you think about the wealth gap? in America right now, the disparity, the difference between the haves and the have-nots right now as it pertains to wealth? Um, I think it's the secret to everything. I think that in order to bridge that gap, we have to learn group economics. Absolutely. And talk a little bit about group economics. How important is that um, in closing the gap? What is it about that do you feel that would actually so cut that gap out? It's at this point now for me, it's mainly the only thing that I believe that will bridge the gap. And simply put, we have to learn that if I can go to the club with five of my friends and buy a bottle or buy VIP, why can't we start a business? If Absolutely. if if I've known you 20 years and we I know your character, I know your kids before they came and I know who you are. Why can't we put money together and start a business? If it's Amazon, if it's uh, opening an ice cream shop, I don't it doesn't matter. Like yeah. we always talk about how we don't have money, but right. as African Americans, we spend the most money. So, right. so for people who don't have cash, don't have a job, living in the projects, all these things, we got the best shoes, we got the best clothes, we got the watches, we got the best guns, we got right. every everything. But what if we, like I said, with with little kill deaf guy, he's going to put his friends on. They're yeah, practicing yeah. group economics. They yeah. get like he got the bag. All right, cool. I'm gonna break this down with you guys. We we have to do that as adults but we tend to get as we get up and get better we get more like i don't know him i don't trust him i wouldn't give him a hundred dollars but my thing is you get 10 of your friends put a hundred dollars you got a thousand yeah when so i'll I'll throw this in there because i've always apparently been about group economics positive and negative when my friends started trying to get in the streets i told him i was like listen i'm on out for this corner stuff i was like if y'all really want to do this i'm for it you know forgive me um no statute limitations on not doing nothing but i was like look we put, I can 
I only asked for money for my birthday, so we can put this money together. We can actually yeah. go buy something, and then for those dudes that really want to be out there, then they can go do whatever. But I was always, I've always yeah, understood yeah. that like we stronger as a group. Like right. growing up in LA, you understand the value of a gang. I was just like, I want to make money. Like yeah. that changes my location. So group economics is how we bridge that gap, but we have trust issues. Yeah. And what do you think those trust issues stem from? Is it again media? Is it a perpetuation of ideas and themes that we hear in music and that we see from our entertainers and from media? Slavery. <laughs> like it, I mean, simply put, it's just slavery. It's 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 a slave mentality that's been taught to break you down. That you don't trust your person, so you look to a person to save you, necessarily master or whatever. But and you bring that through the decades, and you go on to a point to where it's like, this is my neighbor. But I don't trust him. I'm trying to be outdo him. We got to be right. better than the guy next to you. But my thing is community. When you look at uh, one of the things I always point out is the immigrant communities. Uh, per, I don't know the correct term to use, but I'll say Hispanic just for the purpose of getting through this. Um, if you look at the Hispanic communities, you have a thousand different countries. But once they cross the border, they will all live in the same area. The buildings will be in Spanish. The language, they will all speak to each other. We hear if you go to the asian communities especially in houston you have a quote-unquote chinatown all stuff the streets are written in whatever language like i think vietnamese traditionally right. so like there's a lack of communal aspect that we have that we don't know how to build and work together like we complain about the liquor stores that's the big thing when i was growing up but i'm like no gang owns a liquor store y'all selling drugs making money why not buy a liquor store and put right. something there so right. it's, it's this desire to be the number one guy and i'm like you just need to survive. Did you see Killer Mike's uh, trigger warning? I think it was a series that came yeah. out like last year. Yeah, and he he had a, a, a episode about that, about, you know, gang affiliation and how those gangs could monetize not only their brand, but do group economics and do good for the community as opposed to, um, you know, some of the uh, the other <laughs> situations right. that are happening. But, but you but you flooded with too much money. When yeah. the money. The money, when it came, came too large, too fast, and then it got shiny. And that's what you do to your point of music. The shininess now outweighs the realistic, realistic, like what does money mean? Right, right. Interesting, very interesting. I think that it is a, um, it is a problem that's not solved overnight, but again, conversations like this will help kind of move things forward. Now, moving to the next, what you think about, just I'm gonna give you one more, and it's all kind of rolled into one ball here. Um, as we're talking about wealth gap and we're talking about wealth building and group economics what you think about the rise in popularity of cryptocurrency and what do you think that that's going to be in the future to come as far as a foothold in in wealth building i think i think it's not for our generation but it's for our kids generation um what we are witnessing right now we people don't think about what it really is so if you think about how currencies transacted throughout history you know at some point people were just bartering then it was like if you have three pebbles this that becomes the value and so on and so forth we're old enough to remember when you had a debit card and then all of a sudden got a visa you had a debit card and you had a credit card were right. two completely different things right we changed into almost like how the gold standard went away we changed into a truthfully a debt-based society once they put the visa logo on the debit card but if you go to like Japan or any of those countries, they they don't have, well, at least when I went, they didn't have Visa cards. Like the debit card was you had a debit card. You could really only spend what you had. And then you have a credit card or something else there. So I think where we are right now is we're going through the next change in how currency is valued and what's the value. The hard part about crypto right now is anybody can create, a, create something and it's kind of got to burn off a little bit. Um, what I always tell people is think of Bitcoin as the US dollar. Like that's going to be the mainstay. Um, I think about Ethereum, uh, Ethereum, or however you want to pronounce it. For me personally, I think of about the difference between iPhone and Android. Like iPhone is always going to be very popular and it's going to be what people gravitate towards, but you can do anything on Android. And so the Android is the base of like apps and all these other things. So that, that won't go anywhere. Right. So you kind of got to just look at it from that standpoint. Um, that That's the soft intro that I would give anybody to it is just understand that don't fish to be what's going to be the next Bitcoin. 
because truthfully there shouldn't be a next bitcoin there should just be bitcoin and then there's going to be maybe other countries that'll be smaller but there's got to be a mainstay what i would tell people is look into anything how do you transition stuff into real dollars for you now yeah. uh, instead of because a lot of crypto is based in hope and that's why people are going to lose a lot of money is because they're hoping for that that windfall Right, and right. and there's got to be a certain level of base understanding to what you're doing. So if you caught Bitcoin early and you was able to become a, a Bitcoin a millionaire or whatever, mm. go buy land, go buy some property, go get some stuff that like is tangible to your world right now and build businesses because the, the concept of investing and how investments work won't change. It'll just change the vehicle in which it's done. But you'll always be able to transition it into whatever's current. Absolutely. Well, Gerard, listen, that sounds like a critical hustle. <laughs> Sounds like a lot of hustle, bro. Um, I want to ask you before I let you go, um, what do you have coming down the pipeline? And where can followers who want to learn more from you or, or chat it up with you a little bit more find you at? So uh, you can find me at Critical Hustle, spelled correctly, no space, just Critical Hustle as if it was one word. Um, things I got going on, practicing group economics because I, you know, you, you, you can't talk it if you don't live it right. but um <laughs> uh friends and i we started a trucking company uh we all put up the same amount of money to get a truck out on the road so a lot of what i'm looking to do with that company is help turn drivers into owners through partnership um it's called 10g transportation so you you'll see it um as far as critical hustle a lot of what i what i try to do is small business consulting just in general of trying to help people solve their their minor issues um there and really uh help my circle like i i will say this i am the nicest person if you're inside of of my of my group i'm helpful i'm available to all my friends um all their business ideas even if we don't partner even if we, if we hate each other and the fact that we don't partner i'm 100 percent available to them i'm not big on the world um and you know not in a bad way but brian you're my friend if you told me you were trying to save the world i'd be like how can i help you accomplish what you are trying to do no i'm not going out with you to go save the world if you got an event i'm gonna buy a ticket i'm gonna show up but i'm not i'm not like i'm not on that because i think that for me to make compton better i gotta help compton and then compton can go help la so um you know i just challenge people to say hey look at look at um banking look at look at um banking within your family look at ways that you can improve around you and realize that you don't have to have a thousand dollars to figure out a business start stuff with your kids like practice group economics look up the meaning of group economics and figure out who your group truly is because that's when you start to see the difference that's when you start seeing what you can really do and you have resources at that point absolutely but man i want to thank you for spending this time with us you know what i'm saying you've shared a wealth of information i hope this has been inspirational for the listeners um remember like and subscribe you should see that button across the screen there at the bottom yeah and until yeah. we meet again peace and god bless stay creative y'all have a good get my beard where yours is <laughs> <Team messes. laughs> I gotta get a lot of work man this is a lot of work.